Welcome back. Championship weekend is just three short days away. This is Swing Pass. I'm Adam Ruffner. That's Daniel Cohen. And we've got a bunch of questions lined up for the four remaining teams in the 2023 AUDL season. The Austin Soul, Minnesota Windchill, New York Empire, and Salt Lake Shred are getting set for semifinal Friday. Again, just over 72 hours away. We cannot be excited enough to go to TCO Stadium up in Egan, Minnesota. I'm currently back in my hometown of Shoreview, Minnesota right now, doing a little bit of a home visit before we trek even more northwards to crown the 2023 champion. And again, with everything heading to a full culmination for the season, we still have a few pesky questions for these last three games ahead of us. Daniel, what are your kind of open thoughts heading into the final weekend of the season? Well, I'm I'm excited for the games themselves, but I I can't help but be a little bit pessimistic about the the results. And in which I and maybe you can help me with this. I just think this weekend is just so set up to go chalk with New York over Austin and then Salt Lake over Minnesota and then New York winning their third championship over Salt Lake. But I don't know. I think there is going to be a lot of fight in these other non-New York teams. I just always keep trending towards the the experience, the the juggernaut, the dynasty that is the the New York Empire. I mean, I I feel like something similar happened in 2021, though. I felt like we all kind of were lurching into that weekend thinking New York is going to be the clear favorites. They were the reigning champs kind of by decree. There was obviously no 2020 mm-hmm. season, but they had that perfect season in 2019. They lost twice in the regular season in 2021, but the way they came out of that Atlantic division, maybe the strongest division we've ever seen in this league's history, and the way that they were kind of just forming around that talent, that nucleus of Yacht, Williams, Osgar, Babbitt, that has just pushed them into this dynastic realm. It Mm. felt like they were the clear-cut favorites in that bracket, and yet Carolina Flyers came through, played some of the best ultimate we've ever seen on both sides of the disc, and came away with the 2021 crown. And I feel like Salt Lake has a potential at that. And I feel like yes. Minnesota and Austin are such wild cards in the sense that whenever we seem to think we know what these teams are, they sort of <laughs> shift a little bit. You know, in the midseason That's point, true. it looked like Minnesota was going to be rolling, setting up this really interesting stylistic matchup with Colorado in week nine, was it now? And almost two months ago. <laughs> Uh, you know, it felt like we had a sense of what Minnesota was going to be. They were getting back Abe Coffin, and yet they suffer this 10-goal loss on the road. And then it just kind of sets up this back half where they've sort of had to rebuild, I think, a bit of their identity as they've built more of their rotations around some of the people who have been filling in in the absences of some of the starting line uh, injuries and overall roster absences that the Windchill have sustained throughout 2023. And yet here they are heading into championship weekend and they feel like, I think, a more strong version of themselves than even they were coming off of that big Madison win back in week eight. It feels like their offense is a little bit more rebuilt and retooled. The emergence of Will Brandt and even healthier Abe Coffin, a sort of, I think, Mm -hmm. shift in how they focus the disc and use a little bit more of their uh, role players, for lack of a better way to put it, rather than just kind of the one, two shots downfield to Brian Vanuka or Quinn Snyder, the Minnesota's favored. But anyways, we're getting off into the weeds. We can save some of this for actual discussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that this bears a little bit of a resemblance to 2021. Now, to your point, I agree with you. I think that this is setting up to be a very chalky weekend. But I'm just saying we don't know until these games are played. Salt Lake Gotta looks like a terrific games. competitor for New York. It will lead into one of the questions we have today, which is can Salt Lake win in a potential rematch with New York? But that'll be on the back end of this episode. Let's start up front with the first semifinal game between Austin and New York, slated for a 6 p.m. Eastern start on AUDL TV on Friday night. If you're not going to be in person at TCO Stadium, you're going to want to tune in for that. But... What can Austin do to affect this New York juggernaut, right? We've seen the Soul team now punch down two, their two biggest rivals in competition, Carolina and Atlanta, basically in back-to-back weeks. And yet, there is still so many questions about the Soul team. They lead the league in break rate, meaning that they get 
more breaks scores more consistently than any other team against opposing offenses. That is a big credit to the identity the Soul team has been building around their defense. Their offense is starting to come into a more efficient version of themselves. They still like the long ball and the big play a lot, so there are going to be some mistakes and inefficiencies. But they have back-to-back -back games as a team just turning the disc over 13 total times. That is the kind of number I think you and I associate as being a championship-level number. It feels sure. like anything in excess of that at championship weekend really just tilts into kind of a messiness that doesn't lead to too many uh, appearances on the throne, so to speak, for these competitors. So I think that Austin is developing this look, right, this feel of a championship team. And yet they're going to have it tested absolutely by the actual reigning <laughs> champs and what appears to be the strongest team we've ever seen in AUDL competition in the 2023 New York Empire. I mean, they are a war machine on defense. They run two starting lines on that side of the disc. And then on offense, they were down ostensibly the 2023 MVP so far in Jeff Babbitt in the East Division title game. They lose John Lithiau to an injury in warmups, and then they go ahead and have the lowest turnover game ever in AUDL history we've talked about before. What can the soul do? Can they play make? Can they reduce their turnovers? Can they play a New York style of efficiency to make themselves competitive, especially in the second half of these games where New York just seems to hit a turbo booster. I mean, remember last year at championship weekend, yeah. it's, it, I, it's easy to forget both in the semifinals and in the finals, uh, Carolina and Chicago to their credit, were playing the empire. Well, until points, yeah. until there was some seminal it, play in the Carolina game. It was a buzzer beater at the end of the first quarter, the John Randolph hand block into the leak out fast break score from Ben Yacht to Marquez Brownlee. And then the final game, it was really that Jeff Babbitt buzzer beater at the end of the third quarter coming down out of the pack with that big sky goal. Very emblematic of how New York has been playing at a championship level the past several seasons. They get the biggest plays from their biggest stars in the biggest moments. Seoul mm -hmm. has felt a little bit like a team that can do that too. Obviously, Kyle Henke has been just a highlight machine this offseason. But elsewhere, I mean, Evan Swiatek has transformed into an all-around star Big the past season. three seasons. It feels like Steven Nagy is getting the most out of a lot of his players. He's transformed Duncan Robinson and Mark Evans into two of their biggest throwers the past two seasons, just inserting guys into big volume roles and letting them flourish as playmakers. If there was a team in this bracket that could maybe go high octane for high octane with New York, could it be the soul? I, I, I'm just throwing as many questions as I can at you. <laughs> Feel free to pick and choose which ones you yeah. want to answer. I'm just kind of trying to set the table here. Sure. I I think Austin's best chance of affecting New York is playing their their kind of looser, puck heavy style of offense because other teams do get sucked into that at times. We saw it maybe at, at a few points with Atlanta, particularly on Atlanta's D line. Like if Austin had a big downfield turnover, Atlanta might just decide to huck it back. The problem is New York is one of like the most well equipped teams to kind of just stick to what they know and stick to what they're good at and not get sucked in to a game they don't want to play. But they're also a team that has big throwers in Ryan Osgar, Charles Weinberg, Jack Williams has been airing it out. Like they, they can definitely elevate to that style of game where maybe like they don't put as much pressure on themselves to take care of the disc every single possession. Now this is New York and they're coming off again, the, most efficient AUDL game ever played. And so like, I don't, I don't doubt their ability to take care of the disc, but I think there's going to be some temptation when they're playing against Austin to just like fire back responses in terms of, of big downfield looks. And honestly, if the game turns into that, I still feel like I favor New York to just convert more of those opportunities than Austin, but it at least gives Austin a fighting chance if they can combine that with just added defensive pressure, which they've been one to do in the past two playoff games that they've played. Because that D-line break rate, that or their conversion rate, that's kind of been the bigger reason for their wins. I think they were, what, like seven of eight against Carolina and something very similar against Atlanta. Like they are playing very efficiently on defense. And if they can just manufacture a few more New York offensive turnovers and get some more chances that could be their ticket to a competitive game. 
Yeah, I mean, I've got to agree with you as much as I hate always doing it. Uh, it just feels like the chaos agent, the wild card, the kind of like Charlie from It's Always Always Sunny in Philadelphia, like wild card yeah. sort of role is what Austin For has sure. to sell at. They kind of need to break this game down to where they've gotten in their two South Division playoff wins so far, which is who can make the better highlight, who can kind of seize momentum in these playoff environments and kind of run with it over the finish line. And yet this New York team feels specifically built to kind of shut down that opponent momentum right. building. I mean, when is the last time that a team went on a run against New York? I literally can't They don't get rattled. I, I think about they the Ryan rattled. Osgar quote all the time about how he openly asked, when is the last time that this team lost two straight quarters, right? Like when is right. the last time they were outscored in two straight quarters, a whole half essentially? Can't really remember it any time since 2021, really. I mean, yeah. uh, it, especially since the 2021 championship game against Carolina. And so it feels like that is Austin's best course of action. And yet it's going to be against the opponent that is going to be the toughest to allow that. And you and I were talking in the pre-recording right. about how we were a little bit worried that because the bigger go home style seems to be what Austin has to cater towards, if it doesn't work out at the beginning, and this is a soul team that struggles out of the gate at times, they were down 8-5 against Atlanta in the South Division Championship. If they fall behind by two or three goals against the Empire, that is like the last position I think the soul can be in. I don't know yeah. if, I, if I see them being able to make the kinds of comebacks that they've been doing against Atlanta, like most notably against Atlanta in their last matchup against this Empire team. Like, the empire where comebacks go to die. They just don't allow those yes. kinds of break trains to go off against them. And again, like to Soul's credit, they've been incredible on converting on the defensive side of the disc. It's just that that's probably not going to happen against Empire. Not only is the data on their side, I mean, we can just talk about the individual players involved here too. I mean, let's assume that these concussion symptoms uh, continue to linger and Jeff Babbitt can't make it into the semifinals game they showed that they are still capable of just playing at an all time level on offense. I mean, you talk about playoff Jack, you talk about Ben yacht who doesn't have a turnover in three championship game appearances. He has a couple in championship weekend, but when the stakes elevate, he really reduces his turnovers. You could see that in the East division championship game where he made one mistake. He made one of the four turnovers. He was responsible for a full quarter of New York's turnovers in the East division <laughs> yeah. final. But it was one centering pass on like a, a mid-range look. That was it. And he touched the disc almost 30 plus times on the night. You know, yeah. I, they get, again, their best performances from their biggest stars on the biggest stages. And I just, I struggle to think of what Austin can do other than get one of these sports center level plays in the first five points of the game and kind of just run like mad and carry that momentum as far as they possibly can. I, I I right. don't have a blueprint for Austin being able to trade out with New York in the second half of a game. Like we've seen with DC, like we've seen with Carolina, like we've seen with some of these challengers that have played New York well into the second halves. I just, the soul weren't even doing that in the South division championship game against Atlanta. I mean, as fantastic of, of a performance as Kyle Henke had, he had a late fourth quarter turnover. We forget about it because yeah. of all the other highlight plays, but like, there were still some critical errors for Austin. I mean, they yeah. gave Atlanta two different possessions in sudden <laughs> death, and they still managed to get the win, and obvious credit goes there, but that's not going to fly against New York. It's that not will straight up just result in the end of their season. You know, these for are sure. game-forfeiting mistakes against a competitor like the Empire, and so, yeah, man, I yeah. mean, what like, what is it going to take? Is it going to take you know, three breaks in the first quarter. That's kind of where my mind goes. It's that yeah. sole defensive intensity right away, though. Not waiting until the second half, not getting into the thick of the game. It's got to be right. right away. I am I am worried about the first quarter. And we can talk about it. I mean, Jake Radak got a, a one-quarter suspension for his play against mm -hmm. Atlanta. So they'll be without who's been their, their QB1 over the past two seasons. Like, that's a pretty significant loss to the offense they have Duncan Fitzgerald back there but I don't really know who they're gonna pair back there with them so with Fitzgerald so like I don't know what what type of consistency we're gonna see 
from the Austin offense and playing against one of the best defenses, arguably the best defense in the league. Like I think New York can just kind of clamp down that pressure really early. And so I worry about Austin's ability to fight back if they do go down by a couple breaks after that first quarter. Obviously, yes, they did. They did come back right away against Atlanta. Like the second quarter, they were able to even things back up. But like you said, I, I think New York playing with the lead is is kind of a different beast, especially in the second half. We see those possessions that Jack Williams, Ryan Osgar, Chartok, Salman Rushmeyer, Bailey, they can just like play catch for multiple minutes at a time and just bleed game clock late. So I I don't really see a good path to success if Austin does go down early in the first quarter. We shall see. I mean, I do want to see some of these individual matchups, and we'll get a little bit more into the nitty-gritty on Thursday when we do our more formal game previews for the semifinal games on Friday. But I really want to see some Joey Wiley and Matt Armour matchups on who they draw in New York. If we get a yeah. Wiley Osgar or a Wiley Jack Williams matchup, I just think that's going to be Those will real be good. good ultimate expecting. But again, we'll save that for Thursday. Let's continue to move on through our questions. Next big question is, which one of these damn New York stars is going to have a just bonanza weekend, right? It's, it's one every different year. In 2019, it was Grant Lindsley who will now be rostering with Salt Lake in this weekend's mm-hmm. Final Four bracket. Very interesting. And I think someone you're having earmarked for this week's Players to Watch article, which will be coming out in the next day or two. Um, he's obviously been one of the historically great performers in the championship weekend event. He won a title in 2017 with San Francisco being arguably the best player in the field. He won one in 2019 in New York's first perfect season, arguably being the best player on the field. It'll be interesting to see if he kind of elevates once again, he's been a little bit more of a cog piece with the shred. Anyways, getting far far too far into another tangent. (laughs) Which one of these New York stars this year is going to elevate, right? Last year was sort of the crowning of the playoff Jack uh, a narrative that has been building. But before that, obviously, Ben Yacht has had huge, huge championship weekend oh, yeah. performances. He was gigantic in that 2019 win. I think he had 10 or 11 combined scores over, you know, 500 total yards of offense, no turnovers. Feels kind of like Ryan Osgar is right there. He had a fantastic weekend last year on the receiving side of the disc. He got pushed Mm -hmm. a little bit more upfield and just torched opponents in the semifinals and finals. Who are you looking to this weekend as being that New York star that just elevates to a different level? I think I'm team playoff Jack still. I, I was, I feel like we talked about it before the divisional championship game. Like, do they need playoff Jack this year? And, you know, the answer is probably no, that they never really need him, but he's there if if and when they do. But I still think there is just an extra elevation and an extra dependency on your top players. Jack Williams, I still think many consider him the best player in the world and playing at the, the highest stakes in the AUDL, you're just going to kind of gravitate towards those players in those moments. And so I think Jack Williams is still going to handle a pretty big workload in the backfield, and he is going to be the primary driver of this offense. I also feel like there's no there's no real limiting him. It's just like if the rest of the offense is rolling, then he's not needed. So like no one has really shown any ability to stop Jack Williams in the red zone or from you know milking the clock for multiple minutes at the end of the game. So I just think the disc is going to be in his hands a lot, and so he's... He's my pick for uh, another championship weekend MVP. Or honestly, identifying the matchups that favor some of his more uh, risky shots. Like he had a couple of those just Ben Yachts down there somewhere, sort of grip it and rip it backhands in the East yeah. Asian final. And I think that also is a credit to him of really knowing when and where to take those opportunities. We obviously don't think of him as just a trigger happy shooter when he has the disc. And yet, he was doing a lot of their yardage gaining with his throws yeah. in against DC just uh, under two weeks ago. And so I'm interested to see if he has that kind of volatility. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean that in terms of shot selection. I think a lot of times sure, in these sure. environments, we see him kind of reducing his range a bit, becoming that real small ball dominator where he just cannot be beaten one-on-one matchups. And that, that kind of builds into what I wanted to talk about a little bit with you, and it's something that Brian Jones brought up in the broadcast uh, against DC, which is that 
you know, to your point about Jack Williams still being considered largely the best player in the world, and Ben Yacht echoed the same sentiments in Evan Leffler's Tuesday toss from last week, talking about the kind of silliness of this playoff Jack narrative. He's Jack freaking Williams all the time. He's capable of right. doing this in basically every game. He has highlights throughout the season, but like to your point, it often feels like when he's not needed, he, he kind of steps back into regimen line so easily. It feels yeah. like he isn't as present as a Babbitt streaking to the front cone and Osgar lacing these forehand and backhand shots through and over and sometimes underneath defensive coverages. Like there's a, there's a simpleness, I think, to Jack Williams' dominance that becomes a little occluding at times. But getting back to Brian Jones and what he commented on on the broadcast, he mentioned that, you know, it's, it's kind of in how we define what is the best player. And I think what he said was, is that when you really distill it down, it's who can move the disc in kind of any given situation. And we talk about the dominance of Ben Yacht, which was on full display against DC. We see Ryan Osgar putting together these artistic throwing compositions game in, game out. And yet when you think about it, Jack Williams is just kind of that fundamental, it's unable to dispossess him from his rhythm unless he's right. going through something. And I think that kind of gets to your point. I think that that's what Brian Jones starts to talk about, right? Like there's just, it's not like he doesn't make mistakes. It's not like he's incapable of having throw or throwaways or something. It just often feels almost self-inflicted or like a regression to a mean point where it's like well everyone has to turn the disc over jack sure like everyone sure. has to make a mistake sometimes and you know i think i think it's a lot of that you don't really see you know him having a, a game where things are aren't working a, a four turnover sort of performance and i think it's that that inability to know what his floor is it's so like always rock steady that we just it's hard to come up with a different idea of I think what greatness is at that point. Cause I mean, it, yeah. take nothing away from him, but like Ron Isgar was rattled a little bit in the East division championship game last year. And that did become a little bit of a blueprint for how to maybe match him up a little bit. I think he's eviscerated much of those criticisms in <laughs> yes. the follow-up games. He seems to be elevating to a level that is Williams-esque in that, the game stakes raise and he just comes up and meets them. But, Definitely. you know, we have, you know, Ben Yacht has games where he turns the disc over a lot. There are even games where Babbitt kind of, I think, steps into the back line and isn't as hulkingly overpowering as he is in certain instances. And yet with Jack, it's like, what's his bad game? He just doesn't score five times, but he still right. turns the disc over twice on 50 plus touches. It's like, there, there aren't like these nadir points. There aren't these low points yeah. that you can at least mark off like, oh, you can affect him in this way, right? Like, right. I know that's well, kind of wanna, long-winded, but. I want to clarify. I mean, I don't really know what Ben Yacht was getting at with his comment, how he was talking about like, you know, poking fun at the playoff Jack nickname because it's like, okay, he's Jack Williams all the time. I get that and I agree with that. I th I view playoff Jack as being like, Yes, he's Jack Williams all the time. And then the team needs to lean on him more in the playoffs. Like, it's not that he elevates his play in the playoffs. It's just he needs to get used more because he's the best player in the world and you want to go to your best players in those big moments. So, like, it's not, it's not saying anything about his, like, variance in ability. It's just the team deciding that, like, it's Jack time. Just wanted to clarify yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and for all the reasons that I agree with you, I'm actually picking someone else. I actually think it's going to be Osgar. Osgar's, again, been playing like he has something to prove this year. He, and he's just, it, it's, it's different. There's a little bit of a different look for him this year. I mean, I think he kind of got it at the beginning when he had that bad, not bad, I don't want to qualify it as that, uncharacteristic uh, turnover-heavy playoff performance against DC in which New York still obviously won in the playoffs. Um, yeah. <laughs> we'll add a couple more layers to it, but you know, when he went to championship weekend and he kind of got unleashed a little bit more as a receiver, it seems like he got a level of mojo that he has continued into this year where there's just, there's a little bit more of a playmaking edge to him this year. I think we've always known that he's capable of making a big play. He's great in the air. 
He's fantastic in ground speed. We can save his layout form and discussion for another time. That's probably the one area in which he doesn't look aesthetically like a, a Tom Amansky I mean, fundamental artist. It's fine. It works. But it works. You know, it, it's like he got this extra bit of juice and he's just continued to run with it this year. He seems pissed off a lot of times in certain <laughs> one-on-one matchups. He's got that kind of competitor zeal of you're throwing who on me? You know, he's kind of been doing that a little bit, even to Jasper Tom and David Cranston, who were the two defenders Definitely. who did such a good job against him. He's been picking on them when he's matched up against them in the few matchups against DC this year. It'll be interesting to see if he gets a little bit of that against an Austin team who played chippy on the borderline of cheap against uh, against Atlanta, excuse me, in the South Division final where they were just physical on top of physical on top of physical. Obviously, the radar yeah. suspension being kind of the keynote of that. But there was a lot of body bumping and grinding going on from those soul boys against the hustle. I don't think that works against New York. I think that that is something that the soul will have to figure out an adjustment for. I don't think that they a have the size and B have the wherewithal to deal with a not only focused New York team. Like we'll get to that in a second about how this empire team is just the most focused franchise we've ever seen, but you don't want to give them more bulletin material. It feels like that's almost what happened in the East division final where they lose Babbitt and Lithio basically at game time. And it's like, all right, right. we got to focus and win it. We, we have another reason to go out here and perform excellently. We've got to do it for two of our biggest starters. And we've got to show we can still play empire disc, even without two of our biggest playmakers. And they went out and did that. It's like, you don't need to add a layer of, and now we're pissing them off. Now we're getting yeah, like a more physical version of Yacht or a, a, an Osgar who just wants to disassemble you piece by piece anywhere on the field. Like I, yeah. I, I, I think that Osgar is going to kind of be a little bit of the firebrand that New York needs this weekend, especially if Babbitt can't go. I don't know the condition or statuses of Babbitt and Lithia's injuries. Obviously, we, we wish them all the best. We hope to see them on the field the championship weekend without Ben – or Jeff Babbitt just feels missing something, you know, but. Yeah, no, I, I'm curious. What do you think that I'm kind of, I want to pivot to like a sub question of this when it comes to like the overall MVP race, do you think that Babbitt missing that game against DC and New York still doing what they always do and Ben Yacht slotting in as a perfect replacement? Does that hurt Babbitt's MVP candidacy? Like, do you now, lean more towards Osgar or one of the other guys across the league, Jordan Kerr with Salt Lake. What did, like, what did that do for your, your MVP race internally? I don't know if it hurt him so much. Like, I don't think it diminished him I think him it hurt yet. him. I, think I don't, it hurt I don't, it, it's more, it, I guess it more so put more challengers in my head. I had Babbitt pretty clear cut as the MVP. With Ben Yacht switching back over, setting a receiving yard record and making everyone aware and then connecting that to his big play in week three against DC where he made that overtime sky and just the way yeah. that he's been there for this team. Like, I think it just, I think it complicates. I think if Babbitt comes back and has sure. two good to great games in the semifinals and finals this upcoming weekend, that kind of dashes it for me. I think mm -hmm. that he just needs to play. But if he can't make it, yeah, I think that really opens the door for a lot of other questions as to who might be the most pivotal piece at New York's greatest moment. I, it's hard, man. Like, again, I oh, thought I Babbitt was yeah. pretty clearly the fulcrum piece on which this New York's power rested. Just his his indominance, right? Like the, the way in which we talk again and again about when it gets down to one-on-one -on -one matchups, who's going to take care of a Benyat? Who's going to take care of a Jack Williams, uh, a Ryan right. Oscar? And at the chief of that list, it felt like this year, was Jeff Babbitt shrieking to an open cone and screaming at everybody on the face of the earth <laughs> that was his. You know, well, like you there's think, not a more there's yeah. not a more indelible moment this year. I'm sorry. Like the three right. spike yacht situation, the the theatrics out in the West Coast at the end of the regular season, all great stuff. To me, it's Ben Yacht week three needing to get open in small spaces and just freight training past the entirety of DC's defense across the horizontal front. And line and letting 
everyone know about it. Like, I do think it's just, fully possible that we see a lot of that from if Babbitt plays this weekend. Because, like, if the Austin game is at all chippy or trash talky, like, Babbitt's going to be fired up. Obviously, if they get to the championship game, the, the stakes speak for themselves at that point. So it could definitely be a Babbitt takeover weekend. Hopefully, he is healthy enough to play. But, yeah, I kind of view, like, if he's not healthy enough to play, I still favor New York just as much as I would otherwise. All right, that's enough New York Austin talk for now. We will, again, get more into the matchup preview metrics and everything on Thursday's formal preview pod. But let's switch over to the second semifinal, one hosted by the hometown Minnesota Windchill against what has been the number two challenger to New York all season. Of course, they lost back in week 12 to the Empire at home. But of course, I'm talking about the one loss Salt Lake Shred and their league leading offense in this game for Minnesota. What can their defensive led attack do against this kind of impermeable, efficient machine of the Shred O-line? That's the question, isn't it? I I don't have a ton of confidence in the Minnesota defense at this point, given how they played against Colorado. We mentioned that the Colorado offense just kind of ran right through them in that 10-goal win back in whatever that was, week nine. Uh, and then we saw Salt Lake's offense go up against probably the, the other best defense in the league, which is New York's, and really wasn't too bothered. Like Salt Lake's offense fared very well against a very good and very deep New York defense. I, I do think the X factor could be the Minnesota home crowd. And if weather is at all a factor, I don't know how TCO Stadium is going to compare to Seafoam Stadium, which is where Minnesota typically plays their home games. But obviously, they're going to be the most well-equipped team to play in the state of Minnesota, and they will have the crowd on their side. So maybe there is some way that they can generate some early breaks and get that like signature break train rolling that they really have been able to all season. I just, I trust Salt Lake to be their, their typical cool, calm, collected selves just because of how strong that system has proven to be all season. And it hasn't even been like just at home. It's, it's them on the road. It's them in every single situation when the game matters most, they're playing incredibly. So Maybe there's a case to be made that like Salt Lake's inexperience could get the better of them in this game with the pressure of the home crowd of Minnesota. But yeah, like I, I tend to trust Salt Lake over, you know, pretty much every defense at this point. Yeah, as far as the inexperience goes, and it does bear mentioning that Grant Lindsley will be the only player, on, and Joel Clutton, excuse me, there are two players on Salt Lake uh, yeah. with prior championship weekend experience in Joel Clutton and Grant Lindsley. Joel made mm -hmm. it with Dallas back in 2018, and then Grant, as we talked before, in 2017 with San Francisco and New York in 2019, winning titles in both of those seasons. So there is an experience factor for Salt Lake, but I just think back to last year's West Division Championship game in Colorado, where the Shred played that fantastic version of the Summit, just roiling at home. They had to switch over Joel Clutton onto offense, and they punched yeah. back in that game against a crowd of 2,000 plus at Barton Stadium in downtown Denver. You know, like they have a little bit of that that wherewithal of knowing what it's like to face a team making all sorts of highlight plays in front of a revved up home crowd and still being able to come back in waves, still being able to kind of dig their heels in and not allow, you know, a three goal deficit to become anything more and to kind of continue to work away and chip away at those margins. That's how they got into a position where they were within striking distance nearing the end of the third quarter in that 2022 rest division final. Now Colorado closed out in spectacular fashion down the end of the stretch of that game. But I think that the shred came away with a lot of good experience. And you just think about the overall, I think, narrative or, or I should say results and record base of this Salt Lake team since they came into existence. I mean, they won their first ever game on the road against the two-time reigning West Division champions, San Diego Growlers at that point to begin in 2022. They battled Colorado really, really hard two different times at their home stadium where Colorado did not lose a game in their inaugural season. So I think if almost any team is a little accustomed to 
battling in adverse uh, conditions against a riled up home crowd, it might be the shred, despite some of their lacking in experience of particular championship weekend games, which, you know, mm-hmm. could, I, I think to your point, it could come into a factor. And one of the things I'm interested in seeing is does, does Salt, Salt Lake shrink a little bit and become maybe too over-reliant or too one-dimensional on leaning on a Grant Lindsley to kind of take care of things of, Mm-hmm. you know, stepping back a little bit more into where their offense was last year of a little bit too Jordan Kerr dominant. You know, we've talked again sure. and again, almost ad nauseum on this podcast alone about how what makes Salt Lake so dangerous this year is their one through seven uh, play level. You know, we've talked about how Bryce Merrill has, Bryce Merrill, excuse me, has really tuned up almost every player's performance in this franchise's second season. And that's a credit to obviously everyone involved, but when they're playing seven strong, it's just hard to find a weak link. And I think that given their speed advantage in this matchup against Minnesota's defense, I'm a little bit mm-hmm. worried about can the wind chill simply get in front of Salt Lake enough to get them into situations where they might make a mistake. Cause it's just, right. if you're just going to allow the shred to play catch out there, I mean, they've got two brothers on that offensive line and Luke and McKay Jorgensen who don't even turn it. And they're kind of representative of the entire unit of just, if you allow them to just go out there and kind of play ultimate together, they will crush you. Right. Like, I don't really know. I mean, maybe Dylan DeClerc is the defender that, that can rattle them potentially Paul Krennic too. I know he's been kind of on the come up as a really good young Krennic. player. Uh, but yeah, like overall one to seven, like I just, I trust Salt Lake's matchups in, in those situations more than I trust Minnesota's. And it's not to take anything away from the Minnesota defense. This is just, this is the second most efficient offense of all time behind last year's New York team. And this came after, after the pulling rules changed to make offense intentionally harder. Salt Lake has still risen to the occasion and really improved more than any other team I've seen this year, arguably, uh, to that elite level. And I just don't see anything changing, even with the stakes as high as they are at championship weekend. Well, and to that point, Salt Lake almost never makes mistakes in the shadow of their own end zone, right? Like they are so, yeah. so good at turning it, going away from where they're working it out of. And I right. feel like on the flip side of that, Minnesota is one of the best defenses of yielding short fields off of turnovers and just mm-hmm. kind of blitzing you, you know, 30 yards or less away, getting a lot of those Sam Berglund pick up and throw huck scores or the yeah. clerk just going Wolverine mode off of an opposing turnover. Like, it'll be interesting to see if Minnesota can garner a little bit more of that. I was surprised in their other West Division game this year. It felt like they allowed Colorado too much breathing space at the beginning of their drives, particularly with how they were playing against Madison just a week prior. It felt like they were just winning every field position battle that they can, really just locking down on the first few throws of each possession and making them work out of that end zone, the radicals, of course. And I'm interested to see if the wind chill can maybe do that a little bit better in their second matchup, but now against an even better offense than what they face in Colorado in week nine. I don't know. I, I think right. I think there are a couple levers spots. I'm really interested to see where Krennic and DeClerc, who you mentioned, kind of draw. I've heard yeah. you know, possible DeClerc Lindsley matchup, possible Krennic Kerr hmm. matchup. Because one of the things that I think Minnesota might be able to leverage a little bit on the defensive side of the disc is size. Beyond Jordan Kerr, there isn't a whole bunch of aerial size on Salt Lake. Jason Dunabile is good in the air. Elijah Jaime is good in the air. Grant Lindsay is good in the air, but you can't just throw up trust balls like they're a Ben Yacht or a Jeff Babbitt or even a Joel Clutton yeah. or something. So I do think that Minnesota's defense has a little bit of a taller height advantage if they can pressure Salt Lake. We just don't have any data that that, so late, that yeah, really so works. Not New that York's tried team. to... They're not right? just New York shot. They're throwing up shots in rhythm that are hitting guys perfectly in stride away from the defense, right? It's, it's yeah. Sean Canole just launching throws out to space and having Jordan Kerr run onto them. 
they will have to come down from altitude a bit, and it will be interesting to see if losing some of those air yards a little bit on their throws affects any mm -hmm. of their mojo on offense. If a little bit more constriction, now that we're coming down closer to sea level in Minnesota, if that can affect Salt Lake at all. But it's hard, man. It's hard. And then on the flip side, and this gets into another one of our big questions is, this Minnesota offense, which version of it are we going to see? You know, we, we talked about it heading into the postseason. This was the worst rated efficiency of any playoff team's O-line, the wind chill. They've had some fairly disastrous performances a couple of times this season, most notably in mm -hmm. week nine in Colorado. But they've also had a lot of different rotations. I feel like of the Central Division teams, they might have had the largest offensive variance of any of those, especially in the playoff contender bracket of the Central Division. Yeah. And now that we're kind of rounding into, I think what seems to be their fuller form, it's it's a lot different than where we had them pegged at the beginning of the year. Obviously, we were thrilled with kind of the idea of unleashing Abe Coffin on offense, especially how he performed in the All-Star game last fall. But because of injuries, we haven't really seen a full flourishing Coffin. And sort of through that attrition, it's felt like Minnesota's had to work through a couple of different looks as to where they want the disc to end up in the hands of most predominantly on their offensive drives. And it feels like now they've really settled in on the big hog, Will Brandt. And there's just, there's, there's a, we've talked about before, there's an ease that he has with the disc. It's been apparent since his rookie season when he came in as a teenager in 2021. He doesn't. Mm -hmm get flat. There's a little bit of a Jack Williams there. It's hard to get him out of his rhythm because he's so good in short spaces and in really stretching things out when you allow him looks at the deep ball for him to just kind of work into wherever he wants to on the field. And you can see that against Indy. I mean, he was just in his bag in that game. And I yeah. think that they've become a more interesting offense as a result because they're not so, again, what we started off the beginning of the show saying, they're not so downfield one two looking for Quinn Snyder looking for Brian Vanuka they're engaging right. a little bit more of the Jordan Taylor the Colin Barry as a thrower which is a really interesting development for the Minnesota offense using his size to keep defenders honest and on the back of him but allowing his lefty big throws to kind of open up more of the midfield continuation spaces it gives a little bit more freedom for Bevon to be a little bit more of a receiver I like the way that Minnesota's offense is shaping up i'm just worried that they don't have enough reps as this unit as this rotation yeah. against the salt lake defense that can be gotten like there's been incidences of offenses having success against them this year but they're wildly athletic and they're going to be hunting from the very first possession of the game and Minnesota, again, is just, they're kind of easy to knock out of rhythm. They gave up a break to uh, begin the game in the Central Division Championship against Indy. You know, like, this is yeah. a team that can kind of fall behind early. And I worry about that, it, similar to Austin against New York. You can't have that happen against Salt Lake, especially when their offense is playing at this level. Right. I You mentioned Will Brandt, Abe Coffin. Those are the two names that I'm kind of circling on Minnesota's offense for sort of opposite reasons. Like Brant really stepped into the primary center handler role against Indy, which to me kind of came out of nowhere. Like you said, we saw him in 2021 from the get-go as like a really good complimentary handler to Andrew Roy. And yeah, very, very safe, reliable throws, always keeps the disc moving, knows how to get resets. But this was like him like taking charge of the offense, which I think is a role we saw Abe Coffin in with the D line that last year, like this was a very high touch ratio for Brandt. I think he touched the disc somewhere like 55 times. No one else had more than 35. So like most of the touches were being funneled to Brandt. And with Abe Coffin, I just don't like, he, he just hasn't hit his stride at all with the Minnesota offense. And I don't know if that's just like a lack of a, a truly defined role. Like if they're still kind of messing around, do they want him in the backfield? Do they want him more downfield? Or is it just limitations after coming back from injury? It's so, like we haven't seen Abe Coffin like truly return to form, I feel like. But maybe this is a chance. We saw him at championship weekend in 2019. That whole playoff run, he was fantastic with Dallas. Last he year in Central Division diabolical. Championship game. Yeah, and last year in the Central Division Championship game against Chicago, it was a terrible game for Minnesota, but Abe Coffin was like the lone bright spot 
on either side of this. So I, there is like something of a big game mojo that he brings. I just like don't know if that system has really found the ideal spot for him. So like I don't know if they're going to go right back to the Will Brandt quarterback system or if they're going to try something new with Abe Coffin. But it seems like if Abe Coffin is just kind of a cog in the system, I worry about the ceiling that the Minnesota offense can hit, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think other than Bevon, they've lacked a definable playmaker this season. You know, Quinn Snyder is fantastic at kind of releasing deep. But aside from that, it's been a lot of, as we've talked about throughout the season, kind of getting stuff by committee. There were a few games where Tristan Vandy Mortel stepped over on the offense and had big yeah. possession games. There's been a couple of nice Jordan Taylor games. They're now getting a set of Will Brandt games. Josh Klain has emerged at points in the season to take over some of the throwing duties. But there hasn't really been a week in week out, you know, person that they rely on, especially when you look on the other side of the field and it's the Salt Lake offense. So you can just start checking off right. basically what each player is going to give you each week. I mean, yeah. submit Jacob Miller's stat line as just like working <laughs> hour sheets, you know, he's yeah. just, he, he's, he's work clock with it. Um, yeah. And I, I, I'm interested to see if in the one-off game environment, maybe the wind chill can just get it back together. If they can sort of allow Brant to get into a rhythm early, if they can allow Abe to get a little bit more mobile. I think you saw some of that against Indy. It looked like they were freeing him up a little bit more to cycle downfield. And that's where he gets really mm -hmm. explosive, right? When he can sort of stretch out his defender and then kind of, make them more honest in knowing that he will engage deep, but then getting open on the under so that he can kind of like catch a disc, look up field and just unleash one of those pure backhands that he has. I mean, he was doing that all game in the all-star showcase. And we just, I, I don't know that we've seen that like one time this season in 2023 with him playing right. the offense and missing so many games. And so it's just like, can that even happen? Is that a hypothetical? Is that something that's yeah, within yeah. reach for them? I mean, I've been hearing that Coffin's practices in the last few weeks have really been kind of the the aid that they've been expecting. And so maybe they can mm -hmm. get that against Salt Lake. Because to your point, like, I think we sometimes forget he is one of the best big game performances. And I'm glad you brought up that 2019 playoff run because that, yeah. that South Division championship game he had against Carolina might be Ridiculous. one of the best playoff throwing performances ever. And then he kind of went on and duplicated it in both the semifinals and finals. Just an insane three-game run. And maybe that's yeah. all they need. You know, like it is one of those things where Minnesota, as we kind of talked about with Austin, like they have way, I think, lower uh, floors than either Salt Lake or New York has shown at any point in the season. There's a lot more variance yeah. from these teams. But in the same token, I don't think that we've seen the best game for Minnesota by any means. And similar with I don't Austin, think so I, either, but it's like, it's like I don't think so because of their lineup on paper. Like, I, I don't know. We've, we've well, seen a, a clear higher ceiling for these other teams, and we've seen them achieve it. The fact that we haven't seen it from Minnesota, like, doesn't that inherently mean that their ceiling is maybe lower than we thought? Yeah, and I think even the better question is, like, is Minnesota's best game even good enough to beat Salt Lake, right? Or That's is Austin's problem. best yeah. game even good enough to hang with New York? <laughs> right. I don't know. Like, yeah. I honestly do not know. I feel like there is enough of kind of a talent gap in these semifinal matchups where there is sort of an expectant thing of, yeah, they might play in the same way that they've been trending. You know, Austin and Minnesota are right now playing their best ultimate of the season. That's why they're in this event. Take nothing away from them. Yet the same fact, Salt Lake and New York have just been kind of a cut above, right? Like they've been showing that from yeah. basically the third work week of the season, and especially since Salt Lake finally got their first win ever against Colorado, this has sort of been what they've been setting up. And so that gets us into our last major question is if there is a rematch between New York and Salt Lake, can the shred come out with a win? Is there anything in this weekend's format that can predictively like <laughs> encourage us to the idea of New York possibly losing a game, right? <laughs> like, We've yeah, kind of been setting this up all season long. We've almost been setting it up <laughs> since the beginning of last year, too, where it's just like, sure. what is the team? It feels like if there is one, it's the Salt Lake team, right? They don't give yeah. away 
sure. bad turnovers. They play tough and athletically on defense. They don't have quite the, I think, defensive acumen as New York's D-line, but they have the, I think, legs and the want to push offenses in the same way that New York does. And I think that all of that, all of those characteristics really make Salt Lake a valid opponent. And yet we already have a data point where New York was playing their second game in a back-to-back at elevation, and they still took care of business relatively easily against Salt Lake, despite numerous good (laughs) charges. And so the Salt Lake team has shown that they are one of the best learners, right? Like they take defeats very seriously and they go back to the lab and they work on stuff. And so is there anything that you see in a potential rematch that Salt Lake can do to get a win against New York? Or is it something as simple like, you know, that it's not in this game again or <laughs> something else? Act of God. I I kind of look at the, the Salt Lake D-line and their ability to convert breaks. I mean, obviously their O-line is going to have to have one of their amazing games where they're only turning the disc over like five times at most. But if the D line can really dial in, and this is kind of where I doubt Salt Lake against New York, because when you compare the offenses, it's like, okay, we've seen both offenses are incredibly efficient. They're both fully capable of like 80 plus percent conversion rate games. The D lines though, New York plays such a like well-composed style on defense where it feels like an O line. A lot of the time with guys like, John Randolph and Ben Katz, and they have their downfield playmakers. And there's just not like a weak point in their D-line offense. Salt Lake, on the other hand, I think that's maybe where the inexperience shows most with Salt Lake. Like in that game against New York, they were only, let me see, they were three of eight against, three of eight on D-line chances. The opening possession, they had such a golden opportunity. Don't right. you remember? Yeah. Chad Jorgensen comes yeah. flying in, gets a block in their own Huge. red zone. They pick up, and Will Selfridge has the, you know, it's the thing of, it's not a bad idea in a in a in a theoretical environment, but it's completely ignorant of your opponent because he sees cross yeah. field the opportunity to punch in that that just let let let's go first point of the game break but he completely omits the fact that Jeff Babbitt resides on that side of the field and just gobbles up the disc. And then New York goes down, converts the dirty hold. I I don't know. Last three games felt like the best opportunity for Salt Lake in the entire game. And it just got snuffed out like a birthday candle, you know, like it was just, it was kind of like, yeah, that was your fun. That was the one we were going to allow you. You didn't take advantage of it. Now it's our game. Now you're going to have to yeah. play an edge down, a breakdown to New York, which is just right. where no team wants to be. Well, and you just know that they're not going to have so many break opportunities. So that always that always like elevates the importance of breaks in those, like every New York DC game. Like you just know there aren't going to be a lot of chances. So you have to fully take advantage of the few chances that you have. I mean, in the end, it's going to come down to Salt Lake has to play a game like Carolina played in the 2021 championship game where it's like eight or fewer turnovers. Maybe, maybe that will be enough to beat New York. But they, obviously that has to come on both sides, offense and defense. Total hypothetical here. One of the things we don't talk about too often because they're just too damn dominant is that New York is one of the older rosters in the AUDL. They have a lot of guys guys firmly in their prime they have a good bulwark of veterans who have been legacy players for this new york team for years obviously the drosts at the top of that list but they don't have an insignificant amount of people trending into their 30s on their roster is there a world where a young fire sparking playmaking austin team pushes new york to the limit maybe takes them to an overtime in some scenario on friday night and salt lake has a relatively easy win against minnesota and their younger legs can simply push a little bit more in a championship environment where the shred slight team speed and athletic advantages, just I think a little bit on the back ends of their rosters might be able to tip the scales just a little bit more in their favor. You know, like again, New York played Salt Lake already on the second game of a (laughs) back-to-back at elevation facing a plenty athletic plenty athletic Colorado team that was trying to push them in the same way. Like I, I get it. 
I get that there's already like that's the thing about this damn New York team. There's just examples of everything. You try and come up <laughs> with hypotheticals for how they can be defeated, and it's like, yeah, we've already a, done a version a totally, of that. It was a totally fresh Salt Lake team playing at home against, yeah, call it a tired New York team or whatever you want, but. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. They see were that sucking cans issue. of. They were sucking cans of. <laughs> they were sucking their sucking cans. cans again. It was working though. The cans of oxygen were working. <laughs> they've, they've, as they were pointing on the East Division Championship game, they brought them down off of the mountains, and now the cans of gas exist on New York sidelines forevermore. I think they really like those O2 bursts on the sideline. Did they? Them, did them they have the them against DC? Yeah, they brought oh, the yeah. oxygen cans. <laughs> oh, man. They're just like figured out it works. They're, they're superhumans out there. Yeah, I mean, they've got Pure O2, they've got the sleep masks that they've been pushing on their team channels. Like, <laughs> New York is rested well and ready for this weekend. Yeah, Man, <laughs> not fair. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's just, I, I don't know if you even change much of the game plan from Week 12 if you're Salt Lake. Like, I do think that they approached it the right way. Yeah. And maybe they just hope that they convert on a few more of those. Maybe if they take kind of the onus into their own hands and say, hey, that's on our discipline, that's on our possession skills, let's keep it out of the realm of how can we get into New York and maybe more consider how can we play within ourselves. But, you know, that's yeah, getting all I do kind of wonder, uh, my last thought is like, do you think they would try Grant Lindsley out on defense to try to up there oh, that rate. wasn't what i was i was i was hoping you were saying big clut no again i don't think well, we'll get it i big clut no i don't think it's necessary like the o-line is so good yeah. as is i wouldn't really mess with it but i know like, swapping grant lindsley out when they have a rotation of eight right now not including will selfridge i don't know i they i just think they might need a little bit more comfortability with those d-line possessions and grant might be the guy to give them that it's it's a fantastic point. You know, he won a gold medal last year playing D line for the Team USA World Games team. So it's definitely a role in which he's very accustomed to. And I definitely could see him being a great ballast for that really young and at times a little too over eager Salt Lake. Right, right. A little too hurried. But... <laughs> I mean, but that's that's the whole thing. It's like you gotta let a D-liner be a D-liner. You can't just say <laughs> sure. go out there and play like a Salman Rushmeyer Bailey on the counter when you have your opponent on the ropes. Like you gotta kinda have a little bit more teeth there. And I appreciate that about the shred, especially how it's evolved yeah. from last year. It was just oh yeah, I was gonna say green light. Night Last year was annoying. Last year felt <laughs> annoying at times, where it was just yeah that that way too their much feeling. Last year, that was like a huge yeah. problem that they had all season. Uh, aside from overly leaning on Jordan Kerr offensively, but yeah, that D line was holding them back, and they've it's really night and day this year compared to last year. Well, you know the the pivotal moment now that I'm remembering in that game, I think it was. I think of it as being the late third quarter Matt Jackson interception on the backside. And I think that was on mm. a fast break huck look for Salt Lake's D line. I think it was uh, Colorado's offense getting the disc back and converting a hold of some kind off of a yeah. fantastic Matt Jackson defensive play. And it was because Salt Lake earned a few incredible blocks in that game. I remember Johnny Hoffman had some insano like backside swatting it as he's kind of like flying across the grain sort of play Such but an athlete. we'll see yeah. we'll see i i'm just i am really excited for these matchups obviously we will get more into them on thursday dig a little bit deeper into the numbers and what we expect in these particular games first in the semifinal on friday night austin in new york then followed up by salt lake and minnesota that will do it for our episode of Swing Pass here today. We'll, uh, we will be back with you in just two short days again to preview the full weekend slate of games as we head towards 2023 Championship Weekend on August 25th and 26th. Tune in on AUDL TV, tune in on FS2 for the championship game. And if you can, come to Minnesota, man. It's going to be a fun time. That TCO Stadium is set up for a big event. We can't wait to celebrate it with you. We'll be back soon enough. Bye now.